my philosophy in the buyback principle states it like this. We don't hire people to grow our business. We hire people to buy back our time. Because if we... Now, you can hire people to buy back your time and grow your business, right? But I always say it's calendar over capacity. Because if entrepreneurs don't learn how to do this, Brady, they'll end up building a business that they grow to hate. And that's Mm -hmm. actually the true risk of any business enterprise. It's not that the market might shift. That's always going to happen. There's seasons in life and there's seasons in economies. And that will always be true. But what is the biggest risk to most businesses is the CEO, the founder, the business owner decides or they grow into a place where they they hate their life, right? I call it the pain line. Hey, friends, welcome back to the CarrotCast podcast, where we help agents and investors like yourself build businesses of freedom and impact. I'm your host, Brady Winder, and I have with me a returning guest. I'm very excited to introduce to you, Mr. Dan Martell. Dan, welcome back to the podcast, man. Brady, it's my pleasure, man. I'm excited. I know it's round two, but I guarantee this is going to be better than round one. So let's let's do it. Absolutely. And round one was a really good episode. So this is going to be even better. So let me tell you guys context for why I have a lot of respect for Dan and why I'm personally invested in this episode. I'm very excited for this interview. Um, one, Dan is uh, Trevor's business coach. So uh, Kara has been on the Inc. 5000 fastest growing company list for the past five years in a row. That's extremely rare for companies. You know, since I've been here, tripled our employee count. We've gone through so much change, and that change has been so hard to uh, navigate. Dan has been the guy behind the scenes, behind the scenes, leading Trevor's through some of that change. So, leading uh, software company founders. Uh, he's a software, essentially, software company founder coach for a living. It's a poor I'm, way to I'm the that. coach. I literally run the largest coaching company for software CEOs. So we have a thousand clients, but I've actually been coaching Trevor uh, myself personally for five years. So it's actually been since the beginning, the Inc. Wow. Five, 5,000 and then just like, you know, supporting him and just, he's just an incredible person to coach that it's, uh, it's been a fun journey to watch. Wow. That's incredible, man. Well, I appreciate you for that. So um, anyways, uh, that's the first reason is how well he's helped lead Trevor in our company. Um, the second reason, which we'll get into is um, I found a I found a video of Dan's a while back when I found out he was Trevor's coach that it really resonated with me. And it was how I manage my ADHD without medication. And I had to click on it. Got me. Clickbait thumbnails. Good marketing. <laughs> Clicked on it, watched it. I was like, "Oh my gosh, this guy's legit. This is this is no fluff. This is his actual experience," and it, and it hooked me in. And so, anyways, the the thing in my brain was like, "How is this guy leading a a very profitable, very impactful, large business with someone that their default is is very difficult to focus?" And so, the reason I bring that up is because I'm personally invested in it. But one, the the topic today is buy back your time. So Dan, at the time of this episode coming out, uh, Dan just put out a brand new book called uh, The Buyback Principle. You can buy it. It's actually called Buy Back Your Time. I I renamed the title. It used to be that. So you're not wrong, Brady. We now made it simple. Buy back your time, buybackyourtime.com. Easy peasy. Okay. Thank you. I like that. Buy back your time. So I, I, I would say you can buy it. You should go buy it. You should go to buybackyourtime.com and buy Dan's book. Um, so get the book. But is, we're going to talk about buying back your time, what that means. We have an episode from about a year ago. We'll link it up in the show notes. You can go back and listen to the episode. Um, we're also today going to talk about focus and how that ties into being able to buy back your time. So anyways, let me kick it off to you, Dan. Uh, buy back principle. Before we get into like how it works, why does this matter to you? Where where's the emotion in this? Where'd the story begin there? Yeah, I mean, so it's interesting. And like I'm sure there's a lot of people listening that are high performer entrepreneurs. Like people are doers. Like I've always been driven. I didn't I didn't lack drive. The problem with me is I started when I was quite young and it took me a few tries till I finally started to find success in the entrepreneur world. Um and then when I was 24, that that started to happen. But what what I did, because I didn't know any better, is I just ended up working 100 hour weeks, right? And like just became a workaholic. And I got really good at being productive. Like I bought Getting Things Done by David Allen. I liked all these productivity books. The problem was, is that like, I didn't understand actually how to be a good person, brother, partner, etc. 
and I was actually engaged to a woman at the time. And it was a Sunday uh, afternoon. I came home around two o'clock. I think I told her I'd be home around 11. And, you know, we were engaged for, we were together for probably two years and we're only about seven weeks away from our wedding day. And when I walked in uh, the house, we had just bought like literally a month prior, she was in tears and um, beside herself and just looks at me and just musters the words, I can't do it and takes her ring off and drops it off in the counter and just says, I'm done. Mm -hmm. And what's crazy is that like, all this success that I was after was for her. Like I literally would like work these hours and fly around and, you know, like I'd, I made my first million actually the year before. So like financially I had made it like cash in my bank account. You know, we were running a multiple seven figure company at the time. And I just remember thinking to myself, like how, how can I be so good in business, but just so stupid in life? Like, you know, even I remember my friend Nick was telling me around this time, you know, I, I'd be the guy that goes to a birthday party because I'm like, at least I went, right? But I bring my laptop. So I'd be sitting, like Nick was like, Dan would sit in the living room and just work on his laptop at my birthday party. Like that's, that's not what mm-hmm. friends do, you know? And I just didn't know any better. And, and after that moment, which is bittersweet because like, I think two months after that, I ex- exited my company Spheric and became a multimillionaire. And like, I'd never felt so like lonely and depressed. And I was having anxiety attacks because a lot of my identity was tied up in not only my business, but my relationship. And both of those things were now gone. And that started the journey of me trying because here's what I knew, Brady, I wasn't going to stop building. Like I, I'm a creator. Like, you know, people are like, Oh, what do you think retirement's going to look like? I'm like, you're looking at it. Like, (laughs) this is what I do. I literally... I'm going to try to express my creative ideas in the world and entrepreneurship and building companies. You know, today I run two eight figure companies, uh, High Speed Ventures and SAS Academy. As the CEO, I've invested in 50 plus companies as an angel investor. Like, I also train for Ironman. I have two young boys. I have a beautiful wife. I travel the world. Like, I'm, I'm vol- I was speaking this morning at a bunch of uh, foster kids and group home uh, children. I do a lot of work with at risk youth. Mm. But I needed to find a way to build and not lose the quality of life I wanted. And that's, mm. that's what changed for me. And that's, that's where like, I moved to San Francisco shortly after. And cause I, I wanted, you know, like I was young in my career, I was 28 at the time this all happened. And it was in Silicon Valley that I started to see a different approach to work, you know, and it's easy to dismiss from the outside yeah. because you're like, Oh, well, these people raised $10 million. So it's easy for them to like, implement this strategy. But the truth is, is this is leverage. And, and Naval Ravikant, who's one of the smartest people I've ever met, he's kind of a mentor of mine. He shared this with me. He goes, time is a constant. Okay. So like everybody's got the same amount of time. The only difference is the multiplication of leverage, which is what you do with your time that equals an output. So if you want to do more with less time, then you have to have a better form of leverage. And there's only four types of leverage. There's content, which is this. Think about this. We shoot this video. It's an investment of our time, but then it could be seen 10 million times. It costs us nothing. Huge leverage. Capital, which we all know, like we borrow money to do deals. We borrow money to grow our businesses. And there's there's huge leverage in capital. Code, which is like software and automation and custom code even, like you know, automation and programming, all these things is huge leverage. Um, and then collaboration, which is people, right? Like this is what most people do in business. They hire people to do stuff for them in their business. My philosophy in the buyback principle states it like this. We don't hire people to grow our business. We hire people to buy back our time. Because if we... Now you can hire people to buy back your time and grow your business, right? But I always say it's calendar over capacity because if entrepreneurs don't learn how to do this, Brady, they'll end up building a business that they grow to hate. And that's actually the true risk of any business enterprise. It's not that the market might shift. That's always going to happen. There's seasons in life and there's seasons in economies. And that will always be true. But what is the biggest risk to most businesses is the CEO, the founder, the business owner decides or they grow into a place where they, they hate their life, right? I call it the pain line. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the mission. That's the movement. That's, that's why I wrote this book. It's why... It's going to be a bestseller. It's why I put everything behind it is because I really want to help entrepreneurs create more, express themselves more without hitting the pain line. 
I appreciate your vulnerability and your transparency there, you know, sharing your story with, um, with your significant other. Um, I think it's really interesting that this whole buyback principle started marinating for you. It, correct me if I'm wrong, in a slower season, it wasn't while you're grinding 100 hours a week, like, how do I get back my time because I need it now? It was boom, shattered, epiphany. How do I do this better going forward, right? Yeah. I mean, what, what is funny is that like when I was in it, and I think a lot of people do this today, I just thought the answer was getting more productive. Yeah, right. When I was in it, I was just like, okay, how do I squeeze more productivity? So it was like software and hotkeys and more meetings and all these things. Like I was just like, like I was trying to build a system of being more productive, but I wasn't looking for leverage. Right. And the, mm -hmm. the problem is, is that, you know, in the book, I talk about different, you know, uh, time assassins that individuals usually bring to their work. So it's like, it's not even you got to buy back your time. You're just going to stop being the culprit that actually steals your time from you. Um, because like, there's one thing to be successful and be productive, but if you are mentally not present when you're with your loved ones, then, and you're bringing your work home because you haven't found ways to structure your team and the people around you to, to not have that be the case that you're always being distracted. You're always feeling pulled in. You always feel like there's a fire you got to put out. Then that's, that's the risk, right? That's the pain line that entrepreneurs hit that I want to help them avoid. Because like today, the way I've structured my life with, with my team and my executive assistant and my house manager, like at the end of the day, I don't have to worry about anything. There's zero, like I do not worry about anything that is operational life stuff. I worry yeah. about this conversation, mm -hmm. right? I worry about, when I'm talking to my kids, am I, am I teaching mm. them the right things in life? And that yeah. is beautiful because you have such a higher quality of life. So it's like some people are going to read the book because they want to like increase their business growth and they'll get that. But I actually yeah. want people to also understand there's this downside protection aspect of it, right? Mm. Like you're, you're going to buy back your time to grow your business, but you're also going to increase the quality of your life, which is going to reduce the amount of emotional shrapnel that sometimes shows up like, a lot of entrepreneurs waste time on emotional explosions that they create in their lives by not being present. Think about hmm. all the fights they have with their partner, their spouse, their kids, you know, missing stuff, not being this. And like, and what's crazy is I had an entrepreneur once uh, say to me, he's like, yeah, back when I, when I was starting this company, you know, they were successful. They were like 25 million at the point when I was talking to him. He said, but like back in the day when I started this, like I ran into a really tough moment and I had to tell my wife like, Hey, for the next couple of years, I'm going to be gone 6am in the morning heading to the office and I probably won't be home till eight. So you need to take care of the kids so that I turn the business around to make this a successful endeavor for our future. Right. Mm -hmm. And when he said this, I felt like so I felt really bad for his family because I'm like thinking to myself and I didn't say it cause he didn't ask, but like, I think entrepreneurs make up these stories about like, I'm doing this for these people I love. Yet if you ask those people, if they want that, they wouldn't want it. Yeah. So like we make up these reasons that are not true. It's like, I'm doing it for you. And they're like, I don't give a shit. Like, I don't, I don't need <laughs> It's a justification. That's your stuff. Yeah. They're like, I just want you to play with me. You're my dad. And I asked you to come outside and kick the ball with me at seven o'clock. And you say you're too tired. Yeah. Like, dude, I will never, I've never, I, I made a decision a long time ago because my dad did that to me that I, I work out. Yes. For my mental clarity and all that stuff and physical, but it's so that I always have the energy and I never, ever, ever say no to my kids. Like, I don't care mm -hmm. how crazy my day is. I remember one day I, I was doing 75 hard. So I was doing two workouts. Okay. I had already done the two workouts and I shot 16 videos that day and just a full day. And my son Noah, right after school, comes in. He says, Can we bike downtown tonight and have dinner at the park? I live at the top of a mountain. <laughs> and when we bike downtown, it means I'm towing him back up the mountain, like a big mountain. And I was like, Dan, remember the commitment you made to yourself? And I said, absolutely, little buddy. And we went. And like, it's that kind of stuff, right? Now, you yeah. can't do that if you don't learn how to buy back your time to have the people in your life to create the space so that you can, that you can work out. Like, do you know how many women I coach that says like, 
I could never hire somebody to help clean my house. Like my mom would judge me. And in mm. the same breath, they're like, I need to find time to go to the gym. Mm. Yeah. I'm like, do you think your kids care that you clean the house or that you're healthy? Right. Let's be yeah. serious about prioritization. So that's just, that's some of the mental frameworks that I think through. So I want to get into the, the tactical is like, what are these, you know, how do these principles play out for you? But I want to clarify something first before we do. So j- just to re-cement this for anyone listening and watching, there was a heart change, um, a mindset shift before any of the productivity minutia. There was a, this has to be about my quality of life. Th- this has to be about the people around me. It was seeing past yourself, really, because it took that traumatic event to see past yourself to say, okay, I have to care about the people around me. And and now how do I ba- buy back my time, right? I actually, not, not only is that correct, there was a period before I figured out this solution, these frameworks that I teach, that I had a conversation with myself that maybe I am going to be destined to just be single my whole life. Because mm. I was so driven to create and it brought me so much enjoyment that I, and I was kind of so compelled to do it. And I knew what it was going to require of me. And I didn't have an answer for how do I do that and other stuff that I was like, maybe that's just my story. Like that's just going to be what my life's going to look like. I'm never going to be married. I'm never going to be in a relationship. I won't have kids like that. that, There was like a six month period where that was my conversation. And, and, and and it was just this like fear of that. Cause like the amount of people I've talked to that get to the end of their life, or you read these books about like people that work in hospice and you know, like the people's top regrets, like it's all these things where it's like, they don't wish they spent more time at the office. They wish they had a a better relationship with the people they cared the most about. And I was like, well, I don't want to not have these things. Like I had a desire to be in a relationship. I wanted to have kids. Like I wanted these things. So it was like, it was this deep emotional, like, uh, conflict internally with myself. And then just like, I I'm intellectually, I must be intellectually like smart enough to figure this out. Like this can't be a non solvable problem and I'm willing to commit to trying to figure it out. And that, and that's what I've done. And it's why I've coached, literally thousands of people on this methodology and it was never available public. Like this was the Mm -hmm. the reason I wrote the book is I've taught Trevor this five years ago and I've been teaching for a decade. Um, Because it's the first thing I teach because if you don't understand how to get your time back, then you don't have time to execute the growth playbook stuff that I teach, right? So it's like a, it's like a first principle, you know? So walk me through this, Dan, now that you've piqued my interest, now that we've got to the, the, the real heart of the issue, hopefully people listening to this have some, have some conviction that resonates with them. Um, but how does this play out practically? What's step one, Dan, I'm overwhelmed. I'm working hundred hours a week. I can't step away from my business. If I do, everything's going to fall apart. I'm doing this for my family. What do I do? So there, there's kind of like three core frameworks. Um, the first one is the buyback loop. So it's like no matter what pain line you hit, the the you'll never you'll never escape it. Like every level has a ceiling, you hit the ceiling and then this is the feedback loop. I call this the pain line. When you hit the pain line, you have to execute the buyback loop. And the buyback loop is a three-step process which is audit, transfer and fill. Right? The audit part is you got to audit your calendar. Most people don't have enough self discipline or reflection to actually ask themselves or look at where do I spend my time? So I teach this framework called the time and energy audit. Because my philosophy is like, as I grow my business, I want to do less things that suck energy from my life and more things that give me energy. And I want to buy back things that are the lowest cost to pay somebody else to do so that I can fill that time with things that make me more money, the highest value of my time. Um, and that's, that's the first step of the audit. It's like, first, do an audit. Figure out what that stuff is. And there's a very structured process, but I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Then you have a bucket of things that are like low cost and energy sucking activities that you then figure out how can I hire somebody to do this, right? And you need to understand what your buyback rate is, but your buyback rate is essentially the dollar amount. Like, so let's say you make 100,000 a year in like income, right? The buyback rate is take it divided by 2000, which is the amount of hours in the year. And then divide it again by four because I want you to get a four times ROI on your time investment, like a dollar investment and in buying an hour of your time. 
So that makes it, you know, if you take 100,000 divided by 2,000, again, hours in a year, that's $50 divided by four, it's $12.50. It may not sound like a lot, but there's a lot of stuff people are doing from research and booking travels to mowing their own lawn, all these things that you can pay somebody else to do. You might have to get creative, you might have to learn some new skills, but that's the transfer part. It's like I do a first, I do an audit, and I do this every three months of my life because it's so dynamic. I'm always like shifting my my cadence of what I'm doing in my life and I'm hiring people to buy back my time. So I do an audit, then I transfer. And this is a skill. You got to get really good at getting things off your plate. The 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 unique perspective I have on that is this thing called the camcorder method. I literally record myself doing everything. So I have recordings of the thing I want to give somebody else to do. So like if before, I was before getting, you know you're making it into a process, yeah, okay. 100%. I don't make the process. See, this is what's unique. Let's say I was going to get somebody else to do my podcast interviews like you're doing right now, Brady. I would just record the whole thing, not just the interview, but I would record the before and I would talk out loud. So I would just like start a Zoom session. You can literally just log into Zoom by yourself and record yourself. Nobody else needs to be on the meeting and you can like share your screen and do your emails and you just talk out loud what you're doing. And it might be a two hour recording, but if you do that five times, you have 10 hours of you doing the thing that you want somebody else to do. That way, when I hire them, they watch the video, they create the playbook. I can see if they understood what was in the video based on what playbook they created. Right. And if they can't do that, that's a signal to me. Maybe I hired the wrong person. And then that way, even if they don't work out, I now have the training and I have the playbook for the next person to execute and follow. Right. So I use the camcorder method all the time. I've used it for everything from, from building the largest coaching company, from, from evaluating deals on my investment side of stuff. Like there's literally nothing. I even had a friend that does signs and he was having all these issues with like um, people having uh, issues with the installation and the specs of the signs and all this stuff. And I showed him, it's like, hey, if you're if your estimator shows up on site and just pulls out his phone and, and says to the client, like, hey, I'm gonna record this. Um, just so that I have the context I can share with the rest of the team. And they took that 20 minute conversation and had that recording and then shared it with all the people in production and installation and service. You would solve all of your, your issues you're dealing with right now. Like you got 18, 20% of your stuff's coming mm-hmm. back as a defect. It's like everything that they should have known in the installation was said when they did the estimate, but none of that information was captured. So, like the camcorder methods for me, one of the most powerful strategies for transfer. It's one of several I teach. And then the fill is a big one, right? Because Brady, if I gave you an extra two days a week to grow your business, would you know immediately what you need to work on to grow your business? No, but I'd have a million ideas of what I wanted to do. (laughs) Exactly. So a lot of people, they actually don't value their time because they wouldn't know what to do with more time anyway. They're, they're, They're leading a life that's very reactive to emails and meeting requests and all this stuff. So like they don't, they don't really value their time. So like once you do the audit, you're like, whoa, I can't believe I'm doing all this stuff. My time's worth more. I know my buyback rate. Okay, my buyback rate's this. Then it's really this game of trying to like to fill the new time you bought back with things that make you more money. And there's only three areas. There's skills, right? Which is like I think of like a ladder of success on the left side, the 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 ladder, that's your skills. Like are you developing skills to grow? Right. And sometimes you can call those strategy acquisitions. But essentially it's like I got to get good at a skill. The right side of the ladder, you know, straight up is like the beliefs. That's another area you should invest in, right? Mm Because some people don't don't understand how important beliefs are, right? There's this guy, Jim Rohn. A lot of people know he is. He's an OG personal development guy. He's talking about these two salespeople. He's like, you know, here's the power of belief. You got one sales guy. He looks outside. It's raining. And he thinks to himself, oh, my God, it's pouring. I'm not going out today. Like, nobody's. this is not a good time to be going door to door selling shoes. So he stays home. Sales, sales, second salesperson looks outside and he's like, yes, it's pouring outside. Everybody's going to be home and all the salespeople are not going to bother going out in the rain. I'm going to make some sales today. <laughs> right? That's yeah. a belief. But these are things that most entrepreneurs don't realize they have to invest in. So it's like th- that if you have an extra hour, you should literally say like, what belief do I know is not serving me? And, and is there a book? Is there a seminar or some videos is there a podcast I got to go consume to help me? You know, should I write it out? Should I journal it? Should I confront it? Should I call my friend and say, hey, I got this weird belief that's I know is like holding me back from living a bigger life or playing into my future. Can you like challenge me on it and like walk me through how you think about it? Because you don't do this thing. You don't get scared when these situations, like whatever it is. 
So that's belief. And then there's kind of character traits are the ladders of or the rungs of the ladder of success, right? And that's why for me, Phil is is that stuff. It's it's um mm. you know skills, it's it's mindset and beliefs, and then it's also relationships, right? Because mm. You know, investing in relationships at a certain point in business and in problem solving, it's a who, not how problem, right? Like right. Trevor and I talk about this all the time. Like mm -hmm. he, sometimes he's like, how do I do this? And I'm like, Trevor, <laughs> who do you know that knows how to do this? Don't bother investing these six hours to go learn a new skill. Just hire the person that has the skill in 10,000 hours and have them execute and implement the solution in your business. Move on, right? Yeah. So like that's the buyback loop, the audit transfer fill. And if you do this, it's a mathematical equation because because million dollar companies were not built off $10 tasks. It's like impossible. Mm -hmm. You can't work enough hours to generate enough income per hour to make a million dollar business with one person. You have to deploy capital to hire people to give you leverage at your labor. The, mm -hmm. the, the unique part of what I teach is... I teach you how to do it in the most effective way as you move up. And that's the replacement ladder. This is when you're trying to replace yourself, like the, the lowest cost investment for the biggest bang for your buck from a time point of view is an executive assistant. Mm -hmm. Even day one, most people are like, I have a, you know, a marketing agency, so I'm going to hire another marketer. No, hire an executive assistant. You do more marketing. The reasoning yeah. why is like you can charge 100, 150, 200 for your hour doing marketing. You pay somebody 25, 50 an hour for executive assistant. You do 30, 40 hours of marketing and then you keep buying back your time. So the replacement ladder is level one executive assistant and they own 100% of your email and your calendar. That's the unique part. A lot of people, they have a virtual assistant. They just like CC the person on emails for scheduling. That's not what I'm mm -hmm. talking about. I literally yeah. mean, I don't do emails. I haven't done emails in years. Like, I have my executive assistant manage all inboxes, all inboxes, personal, professional, and 100% of my calendar. And then that way I can be 100% present. I can be focused because email is nothing more than a public to do list of every other person's goals, their goals on your time. Is that nuts? Yeah. Right. So, uh, so unprioritized. Yeah. And it just comes in and it hits you. It's like if you had a physical office on Main Street USA, you wouldn't allow strangers to walk in off the street and just ask stuff of you. But that's what we're yeah. doing with all these different messaging channels. So that's level one. Level two is delivery. So like as you, you, you buy back your time, you should have some people help you with delivering the promise you make to the market, whatever that is. Then it's marketing. Then it's sales. And then it's leadership. And that's literally the sequence you want to replace yourself out of your business because it's the best deployment of dollars for collaboration, which is leverage, to free up your time to do the next most valuable thing more often. That's why I leave sales last. Like uh, A business owner will always sell better than somebody else initially. But if you're doing 30 hours of sales calls and you're running a company, well, that's just ridiculous because you're not <laughs> going to be following up. You're not even... You're going you're gonna to get opportunities to take a call and you're going to schedule it five weeks from now. Like It's so crazy, these CEOs that are like, Hey, I'm on vacation for two weeks. How about we talk in three weeks? It's like, that's a deal that could get closed in three days that you don't need to be talking to that person. right? And what's cool mm -hmm. is that when you get to level four, which is you know delivery, marketing, and sales, you actually now have a business that has somebody else generating leads, somebody else closing those deals, and somebody else delivering and onboarding that new customer. So it doesn't matter what business you're in, you're now beginning to have a vision of freedom, like true freedom. Right. And that's why I'm so right. passionate about this because I think a lot of entrepreneurs are trying to do things the right way. They're willing to show up. They're willing to do the work. They're willing to learn the skills. They just haven't been taught the proper sequence. And sequencing equals success. Okay. So you had mentioned... Uh... You know, when most people buy back their time, they're like, "Do you even know what to do with it?" Before you had even mentioned that, one of one of my questions was going to be like, "How do you avoid filling it with non-essential activities?" Because it's human nature to be like, "Well, I have time; I'm going to fill it up." You know, there's a law about it. Um, so, is this? I think we'll we'll segue into some of the focus here, if that's okay. But how do you? Fo is it a matter of? do I not do these things or do I focus on these things? And like, what are you doing to not fill your calendar with crap? Yeah. Well, so it's, you know, Stephen Covey wrote an incredible book called seven habits of highly effective people, right? It's, yep. it's the gold standard. Everybody should read it. And then he talks about begin with the end in mind. 
So most people don't know what to fill their time with because they don't know, they don't have clarity about where they're going. So in the book, as I knew this was going to be an issue, I had to teach this thing called the 10X vision map. And I taught it to Trevor four years ago, right? Um, which is we have to be crystal clear what the end goal looks like and then work backwards and build a plan so that we at least know directionally in the next 12 months, like this is what I want to accomplish. Right. So if, if people are not doing that level of high level vision planning and then breaking it back into a 12 month target and then quarterly kind of rock, some people call them or, or projects, mm-hmm. then of course you don't know what to do. But because I know exactly where we're at in the quarter, in the month, in the week towards the outcomes, and I know personally what are the projects that are needle movers, if I just happen to have an hour open up in my calendar, I would go and execute more of the thing that I know generated the the impact so far around a project. Like for me with the book, like if if I was if I had an extra hour, I know how to go uh, do some chats with people to pre-sell in bulk orders so that I have a lot more sales. Or if it was podcast interviews, I would send fifteen more messages to see if I can get on people's podcasts. Like once you start planning a little bit, like this isn't like some super structured life, but. I already know the activities that are going to have the impact. So anytime there's an opening, I use it for that. But I actually design my week so that the big rocks are already there. Like I already went to the gym. So it's not a question of like, should I work out right now? Because I have some free time. Um, But if I had an extra two days, I would literally for the quarter, I would just go do more of the stuff that I know works. Right? So like Brady, if I asked you like, what... What is the activity that you know produces the best outcome when you do it for your business or for your role? Like, do you know what that activity is? Right. Yeah. I can think of a couple. Yeah. Exactly. You would just do that. Yeah. Yeah. So imagine if you did that for eight hours, you had an extra eight hours and you just did that. Think about material impact Mm -hmm. to your life, how much further you would be. You'd be like, holy crap, that'd be nuts. Now, Does that mean you do that again next quarter when you have an extra day? No, you might evaluate that and say, you know what? I did enough of those and that thing's... Because there's always these points of diminishing returns, right? Where it's like, that's good enough. There's incremental gains going anymore. But at least you you did that. You had some discipline and it does require discipline because, you know, the truth is, and that's why I have a whole chapter called those the five time assassins is because a lot of people... You know, and I used to be that guy, man. And like, I, I was a multimillionaire and I was acting this way. I would literally get overwhelmed at work and then go home and clear up my schedule and just watch Netflix. Hmm. Like, dude, I would stay in bed and I would just watch Netflix. I didn't want to deal with the pressure and the noise. So, so you got to imagine this is a guy who's incredibly productive when he is working, who had a team, wealthy. And even I didn't develop the skills, the beliefs to overcome those moments. And I would go waste time. Is this nuts? I would literally waste a day or two putting off decisions I know I need to make because I didn't have the, 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 the awareness of the strategies to overcome it. So I had to like go right. develop that. Right. Because again, I, you can buy back your time, but if you're just going to go waste it, that's why I like the subtitle of my book is Get Unstuck, Reclaim Your Freedom, and Build Your Empire. I'm not a four hour work week guy. Like, I do not want you to buy back your time to go hang out on a beach. Right. 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 I want you that's to. It's not going to last long. Yeah. No. And, and it's, and, and it's the, the whole philosophy is like, how do you play the infinite game of entrepreneurship? Right. Like, that's the cool part. That's the question I love to ask people. It's like, what would need to be true for you to play this until the, you take your last breath? Like, how would yeah. you structure your life if you couldn't retire? So the question for you on that topic, <clears throat> I like how you, you know, I, it's easy to see how these things that you're filling your schedule with will compound. So investing time into new skills and beliefs, you know, if you have limiting belief that, oh, well, I can't pass these things off to people. Okay. You freed up a little bit of time, invest that time into figuring out how to fix that belief. And then you can, you know, pass more things off. So I, I, I love that framework that you laid out. We're talking about vision. You are working with leaders day in and day out. Give me an example of what is it just a crappy vision and what is one that is crystal clear? I'll tell you exactly. Um, cause it's, it's really a principle. Like when I coach, I don't kind of coach this situation. I coach the principle. The principle is this. 
is that if you can describe a future that is clear as you describe your present, then you have a clear vision. Here's what I mean by that. Mm-hmm. One time I was, um, I took a call uh, with a woman, she had a nonprofit and it was a pretty successful nonprofit, like three, three cities, you know, multi-million dollar donors, et cetera. And she was really struggling with executing her vision. And it was in an area, I do a lot of work with at risk youth. Um, and it was working with like, you know, mothers that were in shelters and whatnot. So it was close to, mm-hmm. close to my heart. And, you know, she, I was asking her like, what's going on? And she was you kind of talking about her frustrations of all these different things. And I was like, you know, what's the big issues? And she's like, you know, like people don't see things the way I see it and da, 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 da. And I get frustrated and, you know, like people deal with this employees, like they don't care as much as I care and they're not, you know what I mean? It's like all these things. And I said, well, do you have a vision? She goes, yes. And I said, well, explain to me your vision. And, you know, she like says, you know, like I want to be more successful and I want to have a bigger fund and I want to be in more cities and all these things. I said, cool. I said, uh, could you describe me where you're at today? You already seen where I'm going, right, Brady? I said, where, yeah, where are yeah. you at today? Like, describe to me kind of what the operations look like today. And then she was like, well, we have uh, 17 people and we have three locations and we do X amount in you know, donor funds and we do three fundraisers a year and all this stuff. And I was like, all right, so let me give you some coaching. Your specificity and clarity on where you're at today was clear as day to me. I could, I, I literally can see and build your operations in my head for context based on what you share with me. When I asked you to describe your vision, you just said a whole bunch more of good stuff. And the problem is, is you think people should see your vision, but you mm-hmm. aren't even describing it to me. And I'm not, you know, I'm not nobody. Like I know how to put two and two together. Um, and without specificity, without clarity, there's no direction right? Alignment equals acceleration. If people don't have a clear vision, especially the folks around you and for yourself, then you have no alignment. And alignment is what allows you to make decisions on how I fill up my time. Because every time we say yes to something, right? Brady, if I said, hey, man, like this podcast, you said yes to doing this podcast, you're inadvertently saying no to something else. You're saying no to some other activities you do. You're saying no to somebody else that you could have spent time with. You're saying no to yourself because maybe you could have went to the gym. Like, But people don't ever evaluate that. They just like kind of have these fears of missing out or this fear of being rejected by saying no to people or the feel of like... There's all these like different beliefs that don't support them to actually express more of who they are and their giftedness, their art, their, their creation. And like, to me, that's like, that's what I want people to do more of. I want them to understand what they're trading when they say yes or no to things, because they've took the time to understand the value of their time, the clarity of their future, and, and what activities that they now know they have to do with their time to get that future to creation. So anytime they get pulled away from that, and that's fine, right? Like I know I could work 100 hours a week, but I don't because I want a higher quality of life, mm. right? Like yeah. more money's more money's not going to make me happier. Sure, I want to have more impact in the work I'm doing, but not at the sacrifice of being available for my kids. Now, that do- also doesn't mean I'm available to my kids 100% of the time either. Like I do not plan and don't want to do that either. So it's like, right. you got to do life by design, not by default. Mm, life by design, not by default. I really like that. You know, I, I've i thought about vision before in the context of motivation. You know, I can sense in my own life when it's like, I'm not motivated. Okay. Why? Well, cause I, I don't, I don't know what tomorrow looks like. I don't know what six months from now looks like. It's like, there's not, there's nothing clear to move towards. Uh, but I had not thought about it until you'd mentioned that in the context of aligning. So if you're, you know, if you're a real estate investor, or you're a real estate agent and you have, you know, big audacious goals to grow your brokerage or to hit, you know, a million dollars a year, do X amount of deals per month and your team doesn't know why. I mean, all the salespeople, if they're compensated well, it's a little bit of a different story. The majority of your team, like what's the reason to get there? You, even if you do have that vision in your head, even if it is clear, are you communicating that well so that you can get alignment and begin to pass off some of those things to buy back your time? Yeah. I like that. What are some of the things you're most proud of that you've covered in this book? There's there's a lot of stuff. Um, One that I added a bunch of, not a bunch, but I added a chapter on leadership and a few very unique 
uh, tools that I think CEOs and business owners should learn because, uh, and you've probably seen this, Brady, like entrepreneurs are kind of crazy, right? They might be creative and fun loving, but they're, they're nutty. I mean, this is just the, the, the person who wakes up and tries to create something from nothing takes a certain type of person. And what mm-hmm. happens is that, that, uh, characteristic, which is a superpower to try to like create and like literally will something into existence that doesn't exist can also be a challenge when you're leading other people, right? Because they don't look at the world the same way you do. Because if they did, they'd be working on their own thing, but they don't, they want to follow you. And, right. and CEOs need to understand how that impacts their leadership. Because if not, they'll just, they'll just burn through people. I've seen this happen so mm. many times with clients. I can teach them the buyback principle and then they start buying back their time, but then the people don't stay and then it gets frustrating. So the thing I'm most proud of is I, I put in these very specific leadership uh, tools, uh, you know, things like clearing conversations. So like how to actually solicit and incorporate feedback into your culture and your leadership style. The one three one rule, which is like how to empower people to make decisions, but you still feel in the loop and aware of how they evaluated decisions. Um, the $50 fix, like how to push things down to the frontline people to fix problems. So they're not inundating you with things. And like that, that, that's um, stuff I think is going to have an incredible impact in the entrepreneurial community. Mm -hmm. Um, I think my whole framework for how to work with an executive assistant, because I think a lot of people have read the four hour work, we can have virtual assistants, but that's a completely different level. Like my executive assistant, I always say like they earn the title executive, right? It's not like, these are yeah. partners. These are people that have context and relationships with your most important relationships in your life. And they see things for you so that you can go do the thing that only you can do and then bring opportunities. I mean, my executive assistant essentially looks around corners and says like, Hey, Dan, you're in New York. And I know last week you were chatting with your friend Bob over email about meeting up. He lives in Manhattan. Do you want to see if Bob's free to do dinner when you're speaking in New York in March? Like that mm. level stuff, Three that's steps next ahead. level. Yeah. So, I mean, this is where like people think like these people are just going to like take stuff off your plate. But the truth is, is if you set it up the way I teach in the book, it'll literally be an additive. Like the, it's a revenue generator. Like it, the, I always even say like, think about like all the things that you take two, three, four, five, six days to get back to right? Like proposal or whatever it is. It's like all these things in your inbox that you're like, keep opening and unmarking as unread or starring and unstarring. And like you on the weekend and it never, yeah, exactly. Nobody ever does that. What happens is like an executive assistant doesn't have an opinion on, there's no emotion, right? A lot of us, we do this based on emotion. They're just like processing top to bottom, right? So like, so all of a sudden, all these things that you would have delayed they're getting pulled forward into the calendar year. And these are good opportunities. These are conversations. These are prospects. These are partnerships. These are revenue opportunities that are getting pulled in a year. So like, I think I get probably two to three months pulled forward into my life. Opportunities in this calendar year that otherwise wouldn't be there if it was up to me to manage this stuff myself. Does that mm. make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So that, that I'm super proud of. Yeah, I think like reframing the way people think about an executive assistant, the way I do in the book. Um, and then I think, um, yeah, the, the, the 10X vision map. And, and you know what? Even better than that, Brady, is how do you bring this stuff to your home? Like mm. the buyback principle applies to your personal life as well, right? And, and, and when you start off like this, this is so simple. Like it could be as simple as like having somebody help clean, having somebody do meal prep having somebody do lawn mowing, like basic stuff. doesn't have to be elaborate. But I've been inspired by some of my mentors and there's another level, right? Like I live today in a world where I have a dedicated house manager. She is the CEO of all of my personal things that my wife or I would have to deal with. Okay, so we're talking vehicles, homes, and I'm talking everything, cleaning Hmm. cars, putting gas in the cars, Uh, all the the food stuff, house prep, like before we even travel for going away for a few months, uh, she'll fly ahead of time and set up our homes. Like all things that people be like, Oh, must be nice. You know? Yes, it is nice, but it was a decision to invest in our life. Like some people buy fancy cars and they're like, I'm working all the time and I don't have time to go to the gym. It's like, dude, 
sell one of your fancy cars and go get a house manager. Yeah. Do you realize you'll actually make three times more money this year by having that time back and not stressing and fighting with your wife or your partner and like living and being fit because you get to go to the gym? Like, dude, the amount of time trades, because this is the game of life really is just getting better at being a better time trader. The, the inefficiency I see people make and then complain, it just, it's just not once you, hopefully once they see this perspective, they can't unsee it. And then once mm-hmm. you know it and you can see it, you'll see it all around you. And you like to me, I, I look at it like anytime I do anything that any other person could have did for me, like I do two things. I spend time with people I love, right? My clients, my customers, my family, my, my, my friends. And then I work on things only I can do that I absolutely love to do that creates a lot of value in the world. And if I do anything else with my time, like put together something somebody bought on Amazon, right? I, I literally go, Dan, you can't be doing this. Ask for help, get somebody to help you. And it's okay because you create employment. I had a client once, they were like, tell me their wife was like not on board with getting a cleaning lady. But his wife was complaining that she didn't have time to go to the gym. Yeah. And I said, try this one. Tell her she's being selfish because she's not creating employment in her local community for somebody who needs that work. Mm. And she's like, oh, that's interesting. (laughs) Got her to try it out for a month. Have a cleaning lady come in twice a month. And now that woman has become a very important part of their family. Mm. So That's again, amazing. a lot of people have beliefs that are holding them back from unlocking a next level for them that I'm hoping the book inspires them to evaluate, to be mm-hmm. able to support their dreams and create more and not put their, yeah. their, their business at risk because when they hit the pain line, they're going to do one of three things. They call them the three S's. They're either going to decide to stall. I don't want to grow anymore, which is dangerous. They'll decide to sabotage their growth and, and slowly retreat a little bit or they'll decide to sell, mm-hmm. right? What yeah. I want them to do is do more because entrepreneurs literally wake up every day to make the rest of the world better for every other person living in it. That is the definition of business. You don't have a business if you don't solve problems, which means you're making the world better. So do more of that. You know, w- what I appreciate most about this conversation, Dan, and you you just hit on it again, is I, I thought this conversation was going to be a one on um, productivity. But the the common thread is is two things: is purpose, but really is people. And so it's about what's the conversation with yourself, and what's the conversation with the people around you. And I love how it's about you know how are you, how are you? Uh, you just said it so eloquently. How are you taking care of the people around you? How are you, are you empowering them? And even down to the processes that you've lined out in the book. How are you doing it in a way where you're communicating that they matter, they're loved, they're valued instead of just the the task person, you know? So I love that. Just making people feel really empowered and showing them that they actually matter. I think that's just a complete game changer and a totally new way to look at, you don't even want to call it productivity, you know? No, it's leverage. I think productivity is what I used to do and that got me in a lot of trouble and, you know, single, you know, right before my wedding day. Right. And now I am a thousand times more productive because of leverage. And I live a quality of life that's a hundred times better than I ever thought it could be back from that moment. So it's a, just a completely different perspective. And I just wanted to introduce people to that, you know, lens on life. I think it could be really be powerful for a lot of people. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing that, man. I appreciate, again, transparency, sharing uh, all the gold nuggets. Well, probably a fraction of the gold nuggets from the book. You know, if we had five hours, I'd ask you a bunch more questions. Um, But I got about two or three minutes, so I'm going to milk it. One thing I want to do before we wrap it up, just closing the topic on focus, man. Um, Before we close it, Dan, just fire away. What are some of the most helpful things you are doing to help you focus, whether that's habits? What are you doing? Let's assume that you know you have clarity around where you're going and you've already figured out what projects are going to help you get there. What I would say that I do that most people don't is I have my life planned the day before. I always review the night before and the Sunday for the week and then the night before for the morning. And Mm. everything I got to work on is in my calendar and it's all put into the calendar entry. So what I mean by that is if like tomorrow morning, I got to outline some new YouTube videos for my channel. 
the document with the outlines and the research is in the calendar entry. The document that I'm outlining the videos is there. Anything I need to do that specific like block project is in the calendar and it's sequence and I'll have several of those. So I like, I already know what I'm going to do. So it's allocated. I don't have white space in my calendar anywhere at all. Cause I, as I, I like rather just decide and, and honor the calendar. And then when I work because of my ADHD, I literally, um, I play a specific type of music. So I use an app called uh, focus at will. And there's other ones out there. You can use whatever, but I use a specific, uh, music track that I like that helps me focus. And then I use a timer. I use a timer called Be Focus Pro and it's a Pomodoro timer. And I work in 25 minute uh, sprints essentially. So 25 minutes, five minutes. And when I, when I do my five minute resets, it's breath work, it's move my body. And, and then I get back. There you go. And like, I absolutely crush any other person because I can do that for a sustained time. And the output is high energy, high creativity, high uh, direct flow state that, you know, like, honestly, if I do two hours of that a day, I'm, I'm crushing people's eight hours because it's just mm. like, it's pure output, right? There's no distraction. There's no social media. There's no nothing. It's like the timer's going. I see it going. I've got my, I'm plugged in with my headset. I know what I got to work on. I open the calendar and I start there. I close all other tabs, all distractions, and I get to work. And, and I can do that because I know what, what it's for. I have a clear uh, vision of the future. So that I would say is, you know, something that a lot of people don't do. They don't have a, um, a routine for how they do work, right? We were even mm -hmm. saying before we started that I, I literally changed spots in my house for different types of work. Like I wrote my book in a very specific chair in my, in my um, upstairs in my house because of the energy that I wanted to anchor in that chair and have a different place where I read and have a different place where I, I, I create um, kind of like uh, work products. And to me, these are all different strategies I've learned over the years to just get more output. Mm, I love that, that those physical cues, that one is huge. Thanks for sharing triggers. those, man. Those triggers. Well, awesome. I want to respect your time. Thanks so much for sharing the tips, man. Uh, any parting words? Yes, I would, I would be honored if, yeah, I'm honored if people go get the book, buybackyourtime.com. You can get on all the different sites, but just come back to buybackyourtime.com to claim. I have a bunch of blueprints and templates and scripts I put together to help make this absolutely like simple for people. Mm -hmm. I wanted to do that. Um, and then I also share on all social platforms. So if YouTube's your jam or Spotify's your jam or TikTok's your jam, just find me, follow me, message me. Um, I'm always, you know, interacting when I can. I have block time to do that, uh, but it is me, and uh, I would be honored um, if somebody read the book and they enjoyed it to leave a review. That's like the biggest thing for me is just leaving reviews on Amazon. Going to help with the movement and get the word out. Awesome, sounds good, man. I'll go ahead and get the book, leave a review. I appreciate it. Those frameworks are the real deal. We use them on our marketing team. We use them at the company wide. Uh, so thanks for making those. Keep it up. Honor. Uh, thanks, Brady. Yeah. Anybody watching, listening, thank you so much for tuning in. If you got value out of this, share it with a friend and we will see you next week. 